All right. So, okay, so what I was going to do today is um, talk about, so, so I've been talking to some of the people who are um, kind of doing some of the work on ataxia or the, some of the key events from the repair perspective. And I'll try and update you on what I think are the current models and try and put a sort of coherent model together. I want to talk about the limitations because this will sort of bring in the limitations of mice, but what they can and can't tell us. I'll go through the clinical trial with this NR compound that several people have asked about. And then I'm going to try and pull everything together to sort of give an overview of the trials that are wrong. Well, firstly, an overview of the various different disease disorders called ataxia, but also the trials and the potential therapy. So just to try and bring everybody up to date and but also to to make sure you understand the key things that we're going to need for today. I've told you DNA is the code that carries all the information to make what we are. It's built up of four building blocks that are organized in a sequence um, on this ladder shaped molecule. And it's that sequence that is specific to each individual. And the, this structure has two strands, the building blocks, and then it's organized in a kind of um, double helical straight structure. From that, a part of that is used to make messenger RNA, which is like a subcode, and that is, has the information to make one protein, which is the worker molecule. That also is made up of four building blocks, but um, this, and they're slightly different to the DNA, So, it, but it's only one strand and it's smaller because it's only got the information to make one protein. And then proteins are the worker molecules they are made up of 20 building blocks. And what's critical about them is how they're folded. Um, and that folding is determined by the order of these building blocks. And that really determines what they can do. I just want to introduce the word enzyme here, which some of you may have heard of. So an enzyme is a type of protein. And basically it's a protein that carries out a chemical reaction. So there can be proteins that are like um, muscle, like, um, like the walls of a house, um, but enzymes are carrying out a chemical reaction. Now, the other term I want to be sure you understand is this term transcription, which is making the messenger RNA from the DNA. We'll come back to that in a minute. We're going to be talking about that a fair degree. Translation is um, done by the protein factory that makes proteins from the messenger RNA, but we won't be talking about that. Now, when we're doing that step of transcription, it's quite a complex process. And I put here um, a figure to try and help you think what we might be thinking about. This is the double helix, and it's got to be kind of unwound locally to be able to make this messenger RNA. And basically, and this really at this point is called pre-RNA, and it's an, it's an RNA copy of one of these DNA strands. And basically you add the building blocks on here. So you're starting at this end. These have all have the building blocks added and you're adding building blocks on here, depending upon the building blocks there. And because um, there are certain pairing um, priorities here, this sequence here will reflect that sequence there. And what I also want to bring out here is that this, this requires opening up because you've got to get all this machinery in here. But also, we'll come back to this, as you open that up, you get sort of stress forming here. You think about a piece of wire that as you try to unravel a piece of wire, it causes tangles or stresses down here. And we're going to talk about some of the stresses as you need to open this molecule up. So that's the background. So these are Purkinje cells. Now remember, it's the cerebellum in the brain, which is deteriorating in 80 individuals, and particularly the Purkinje cells. 
These are Pekinji cells, the big large cells. This is the major part of the cell, but then it's got all these branching structures. But the important thing is that they're very, uh, they're very large cells and particularly the nucleus, which is down here, is very large. And that is because the DNA is open because it's doing a lot of transcription, just like I just showed you. So a critical thing about these McKinsey cells is they're very transcriptionally active. And we'll come back to that. I told you our DNA gets constantly damaged. So this is really that ladder shaped structure. You get lots of different damages and an important agent doing that are called reactive oxygen species. Um, and these are emitted by the mitochondria. There are lots of different damages, damages into the building blocks, but we've particularly talked about a damage to one of these strands, which is called a single strand break, or a damage to two of the strands, which is called a double strand break. And this is the lesion, a double strand break that activates ATM, that ATM is responding to. Aprotaxin, is responding, it is, sorry, aprotaxin is a backup pathway for repairing either this type of break or this type of break. Basically, you could think of it like trying to glue these ends together, but the, the um, glue gets onto the ends, but they don't get stuck together. And how many times have us all, all of us have done that? And, it, and it's a major problem to try and get rid of that glue. And that's what aprotaxin helps trying to do. Um, single, so it, aprotaxin will work both here and here, and because single strand breaks are more common than double strand breaks, aprotaxin probably more working here. And then just thinking about what ATM does, and you're not really going to need to understand very much of this for this talk, but I just try and go, thought I'd just remind you quickly, it's activated at a double strand break, and I likened it, it's not that doctor, it's not helping with the repair. Aprotaxin is, but ATM isn't. It's more like a policeman transmitting signals, masterminding, regulating what happens at a double strand break. And it does this by adding a little chemical group that is represented here by this P to, to certain proteins. And it there's about 100 different proteins that it could change. And what that does is change the folding, how these um, amino acids interact in, in a protein. And that can make it change its function. So it can influence the function of a range of proteins. This is quite a dramatic change. Sometimes it might just happen very locally here, but it can have profound in fact, it influences, including making this protein get degraded, get lost, be removed. So ATM is not repair protein, it's a policeman regulating a response by sending signals. So, and for that reason, it's got quite a broad impact. Now these functions at a double strand break explain many of the features of AT, the sensitivity to radiation, the immunodeficiency, the cancer predisposition. I've been through these previously and I'm not going to go through those now. But what it doesn't do is explain the progressive ataxia. And what, what we know is that there are patients with abnormalities in double strand weight repair and they display small heads um, and, and it's, it's called microcephaly, and it's this forebrained part that is defective in these patients. But they, they don't show progressive ataxia. And in progressive ataxia is caused much more by the cerebellum and Purkinje cells especially, which as you can see is a completely different area of the brain. And in fact, patients with single strand break repair defects much more frequently have progressive ataxia. But the conundrum is that ATM is not activated by a single strand break. And I don't think by and large it's participating in the repair, though there might be a caveat to that, which I'll come to. Now this is complex, but the message is very simple. This is a single strand break. And these are two pathways 
that can deal with the repair of that break. We're not going to go through that. What I wanted you to see, though, is that here are six key players in the repair of these single strand breaks, and four of these six can cause progressive ataxia. And this is aprotaxin, AOA1. We're going to talk about a little bit about this one here, which is called a scan one, and this one here, which is causing um, AOA, called AOA XRCC1. And the, these are all quite a lot more rare than AT. So I've now got to kind of slightly retract what I was telling you in that I've said our DNA is a long linear molecule, or at least it can be divided into chromosomes. But actually, it's not really completely linear. It gets itself into great big knots. And this is an electromicrograph of a DNA molecule, and it's sort of drawn out here. And you can see it gets there's these knots forming. And for that process of transcription, it has to get unknotted. And um, there's also, I mentioned when there's transcription, you can get this stress behind the bit that's not opened up. And that has to get de-stressed as well. Now I sail, and I can tell you, ropes, bits of string, and I'm sure DNA just can get itself into a great knots like you wouldn't believe. And, and I sailed on Sunday and we had trouble with knotting ropes. But unlike the ropes that I have to deal with, the cell has enzymes. So that's a worker molecule that does chemical reaction. And they're called topoisomerases that can cut the DNA, unknot it and seal it back up again. And it, the process goes something like this. This is two DNA molecules and that you can think of them as being sort of knotted up here somewhere. This topoisomerase binds to certain sites, certain regions, but you needn't worry about that, creates a break and allows one of these molecules, strands, to pass through the other one. And that helps unknot it. And then it seals this back up again and you go on your way. Um, and that can happen where you've got a break in both of the strands, but sometimes it can even happen in one strand, which just allows you to become a little bit more relaxed. You're not so knotted up. But sometimes the, it becomes stuck. And it, you, you can think of it um, like doing any reaction. I had a good example of a current what it was now. Um, but doing anything 100 times over and 1% and of the time, you'll just do it wrongly. And these are chemical reactions. And every so often, they go wrong. And sometimes it becomes stuck. And again, it's like the glue um, that, that hasn't glued. And it creates something called a cleavable complex. And we're just going to call this a CC. And then you, what you have to do is, because this is stuck on the end, you have to particularly get rid of it to enable you to, to rejoin your DNA properly. And there's a mounting evidence that it's these cleavable complex that are the evil lesion, at least in these disorders with single strand break repair defects. Um, and, and I want to point out, but we'll come back to this, AOE1 is involved in the repair of these things as well. These are distinct lesions to those ROS, that damage caused by ROS that I talked about, um, because they've got these particular um, enzymes kind of connected to them. And these, as well as ROS induced damage, can stall, can halt that process of making messenger RNA from DNA, that process of transcription. So a big question is, is this the evil lesion in AT? And we're going to come back to that a bit later. So the model then is that these cleavable complexes or some other form of sink strand break that arises from ROS damage can accumulate in these disorders and prevent this process of transcription, and we call it stalled transcription, prevents you making that messenger RNA. And that because Purkinje cells are so dependent on making on this making messenger RNA, making new proteins, because doing so many things, that causes their demise. We'll come down to what might be happening in some of these later stages down here a bit later. 
So these things may accumulate in those single strand break disorders. And at the moment, we don't put ATM in here quite, but they're all involved in, will be all involved in repairing these and they block transcription. Ross damage may be doing something similar, but the feeling is that this might be less important and they block transcription. Now, the other interesting disorder that is informative is AOA2, which is defective in something called senotaxin. And that, very similar to AT clinically, in terms of progressive ataxia at least, but it's not doing anything here. It's dealing, it's helping to unstall stall transcription. So it's helping us get out of this problem here. Um, so that says that, and that's one of the reasons why one tends to go from having this lesion creating a problem here. So with AOA2, you're feeding into the process here. So what happens in AT? Um, there's not that much evidence that it's functioning here, but there is some evidence that you can treat the cells with a certain drug that results in these things accumulating, and then you take that drug away and those things will go away, those cleavable complexes in a normal cell. And there is some evidence that in AT, they don't go away, they remain. And that would say that it is actually helping dealing with the repair of these lesions, but not everybody can reproduce that. So that's a bit unclear, but there is also evidence that ATM can help dealing, help deal with these lesions when you've got this what called stalled transcription. So I think ATM could be working there or it could be working there. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of trying to give you the overview of the model. What I want to do now is talk about some of the work that's been done with mice, the limitations of them, but some of the work that is still informative. So mice don't show progressive ataxia. And really that's been a problem because it's really, we do need a model system to be able to dissect out why ATM or aprotaxin deficiency causes the ataxia. Um, and I think that to understand that will enhance treatment options. But also it's very important to be able to test drugs. Um, there are libraries of drugs available and we could go through those drugs and try to say what would get rid of that ataxia if we had a good model system. Rats, but it's, this isn't unique to ATM. Rats and mice also don't show um, uh, this don't show the progressive ataxia. Um, they do have some abnormalities, but it's really not considered to be the same as the progressive ataxia. Uh, on top of that, there's not good, a good cellular model system for Purkinje cells either, although I don't want to go into this, but that's beginning to improve a bit. So, so the lack of a good model system is not unique to ATM. The, the, um, Aprotaxin mice don't show progressive ataxia. The scan one mice don't show it. There's one exception, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, but this may not be quite the same thing. So why don't they show it? The so one suggestion has been that um, the AT mice die when they're very young because they get many lymphomas. And the, the, it worse in that context than humans. Um, but the rats and pigs survive and they still don't show the progressive ataxia. So I'm not convinced this is the sole explanation and it certainly wouldn't explain why aprotaxin AOA1 mice don't get progressive ataxia. A, a potential uh, model, a potential reason is that they don't accumulate enough lesions. And maybe the mouse brain is just less active. If you're getting that unwinding each time you have to make pr protein, if you're making less of it, you won't have such a problem. Or maybe they're just more tolerant of it. So how can we try to get an ataxic mice? And one of the ways is to try and make what we call a double mutant mice. And maybe if you've been following the coronavirus situation, you hear of the double mutant coronavirus, coronavirus things. So what we want to do is try to create a mouse where you may have two genes mutated. 
and maybe that will increase the level of lesions or destroy some redundant pathways. And that's been done. And what's been made is a double mutant mouse of apritaxin AOA1 and AT. And basically, you remember I told you, you have two copies of each gene, bit of DNA. So you've got to make both of those copies inactive. These are not carriers, they're like AT individuals. Both of those defective for aprotaxin as well as defective for ATM. It's quite complicated genetics to do it, but I'm not going through that. So we've got a mouse that lacks both of these, and that mouse shows progressive ataxia. And this isn't published, but it should come out quite soon. And I think this is really important. What that tells us is that the mice can show progressive ataxia. There's nothing magical about them. And there's various possible explanations, but I think the easiest one is that there are insufficient lesions normally, but when you make a double mutant mice, you increase the number of lesions and that causes the ataxia or that they're just more tolerant. There's two ways you can look at this. And one is that they're functioning in the same pathway. I'll explain that in a minute, but I don't like this model, but I feel I should, explain it um, because the person who's done all this is, is his model. And that is that aprotaxin is working in the same pathway as ATM. And so when you get both mutated, you get a double whammy, you'll get more lesions. The reason I don't like this is that if you think of a road, which is like a pathway, you've got an accident here. Um, if there's another accident and you want to get to there, that, that accident is alone. Having another accident down there is not going to give you a double whammy. It, it, it's all in the same pathway. And to me, what makes more sense is that it's a separate pathway, but they're additive. And you can think of this that if um, aprotaxin is helping with that repair, but for instance, ATM is working to un to allow transcription to take place when you've got a bit of damage. Those two would be additive if, um, if they're both defective. Or there's some other form of alternative pathway. If both of those are gone, you're in a bad state. You're in the double whammy and you've got progressive ataxia. The other situation where people have made double mutant mice, I think is informative as well. And this is, here now you remember i told you it was that a thing called a topoisomerase that does that unwinding and they've made particular type of mice that um they're changed in that topoisomerase protein so that they very often form this cleavable complex so all you've got to think about here is that this is a mouse where you get more of these lesions forming and when you cross that with an ATM mouse, ATM defective mouse, they also show progressive ataxia. So in that case, it's saying that um, if you're increasing those lesions that arise from unknotting your DNA and you don't have ATM, you're worse off if, if you don't have either one of these alone. I should say in all these cases, that alone doesn't give you progressive ataxia. So again, I think it's strongly suggesting that there aren't either aren't enough lesions or you're more tolerant. And when you've just got a bit more happening, you'll get your progressive ataxia. Um, and, and I think this is a link to transcription, but it's not absolute. Okay, now, so that's telling you about these double mutant mice. So now what I want to do before I, uh, uh, at the end, I'll come back and try and pull this together, how we can think of all those different disorders and also in terms of treatment. But before I do that, I want to talk about this nicotinamide rib riboside, NR, we're going to call it, which is a clinical trial that's ongoing. And I want to try and under explain the basis, the science underlying that clinical trial. Again, we need, we're not going to go through this in detail, but this is this response to single strand breaks. Firstly, and, and not relevant to this, but up here, we've got this top one K 
cleavage. This is all the ways in which these sink strand breaks come to rise, and that top one cleavage means from when you're getting unknotting. But the thing I want you to notice here is this protein called PARP, that P should be in black there, PARP, which is an early responder when you've got single strand breaks. And then down here is something called XRCC1, which also is a very, is key to this whole interaction. So these two are working very closely together. And a XRCC1 is the protein mutated in this form of ataxia. Uh, it's called ataxia oculomotor apraxia, XLCC1, I read his name. Okay, so just remember these two, that's all you need to take home from this slide. So this trial is based, so all the, the underlying science of this is based on an entirely different model for progressive ataxia. So I'm going to try and explain the rationale and then the evidence for it. And that part one, is the early responder to single strand breaks. It gets on there very, very early. And what it does is add little chain chemical groups to itself. And I don't want to go through what these are. It's called ADP by, ros by rosolation, but we're just going to call these chains. And they can get quite long and they can be branched. And this process, adding this here, uses NAD, which is an energy source. And, and NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, but you needn't remember that. Now, what we know is when XRCC1, remember the next enzyme down, and that's absent, this guy goes wild and he forms massive chains here. And that results in depletion. You're using up all your NAD. So it's this sort of source, and it's known that that's very harmful. It, it affects the mitochondria. It's believed, and there's evidence that it causes causes neuronal abnormalities, and it's believed it might cause ataxia. Just using up this NAD, and what NR does is allows NAD to be restored, so it gives you back your NAD. So the rationale here is that it's the NAD depletion using it all up because this guy's gone wild that causes ataxia. And now we'll go through what has been done and the rationale is that this will also relieve AT, the, the ataxia in AT. Now, XRCC1, which I told you is the next protein down from part one, is central to single strand break repair, but it's lethal, it, it, it's essential it's really, I mean, if you can't deal with single strand breaks at all, you, you won't survive. Um, but this AOA XLCC1 is a disorder with leaky mutations in XLCC1. Remember, these mean mutations that aren't completely inactivating the protein, very similar to AT variant. And they're mild. I think the first, there's only a few patients of these I think the first patient was a 41-year-old lady uh, who was identified with ataxia. So these are not null mutations. Now, so you can't make XLCC1 null mice, but what they've managed to do is a very clever trick, is to make, to allow XLCC1 to become inactivated after birth, in the mice, which means all the stages of embryogenesis can take place, and specifically in the brain. So the rest of the mouse will all have XLCC1, just the brain is missing. And when this happens, these mice develop ataxia. Um, and what um, they could see that in this situation, this part one went wild. It was what we call hyperactivated. And then, what they were able to show is that this protein is restraining PARP, it's stopping adding all those chains on. And they were able to inhibit PARP, and there's very good drugs that will do this, and that completely relieved the ataxia and all the features of XRCC1 deficiency in those mice. And, and that 
almost certainly due to NAD depletion. And when they, I think they also added that NR drug and that did the same thing. It relieved all those features. So the question is, is this gonna relieve the features in the patients? And the group who have told me who've done this work and I talked to feel that it probably won't. And what they think is that when you don't have any XRCC1, there's two things going on. You've got breaks induced by ROS, which lead to loss because up goes wild. You get loss of this NAD and you'll, that will cause ataxia in the mice. But this is a very unusual situation where you really don't have any XLCC1. And at the same time, you might also be getting accumulating cleavable complexes, and that can lead to ataxia, but it's, it's not leading to ataxia in the brain, in the mice, because the mice don't show that exactly the same ataxia. So they feel that is not the major feature that's happening in humans. And they, they feel that um, this may be caused by the accumulation of these cleavable complexes rather than by um, depleting, using up your NAD. But they don't know that for sure. The, the, there was a study from this group called Will Bohr, um, and they've focused on using this drug and they've used that in 80 mice. And they were saying that this drug can relieve the features of 18 null mice. They re removed the neurological abnormalities, but remember the mice don't show progressive ataxia. So we don't know what's happening to that. They can restore the high ROS levels that we see in these mice and some abnormal mitochondrial damage. They found those rampant chains, well, not rampant, but they did find some chains due to that part hyperactivation, and then I'll relieve that in the mice. But this controversy, and others haven't found that um, you get this NAD depletion in AT mice. And there's no evidence actually to suggest why that would happen, because ATM doesn't function downstream ar around the area where PARP is. XRCC1 certainly does, but XLC uh, 80 doesn't, and I don't think a AOA1 would necessarily do this either. So the end point is we don't completely know whether this will help in, in the human situation, but there's a clinical trial ongoing in the Netherlands that's using this NR. It's a food supplement, so it's probably harmful, harmless, um, but I definitely think it should be used under guidance. And I, and I think whether it will help or not help is currently quite unclear, okay? But I certainly wouldn't like to say, I know it won't, but I don't think there's strong evidence that it will be doing anything. And I think it's difficult of analyzing it because of this dif difference between the mice and the humans. It's really why we do need a good model system. Okay, so now in a couple of slides, I'm gonna try and pull this all together to think about a model for what might be causing ataxia. So I've told you that we get some accumulation of lesions, and I think these are involving single strand breaks. I put in red cleavable complexes because I think there's, this, this is the one that I think there's most evidence for, but I don't think we can eliminate that there's not some ross induced damage. And this, all these, forms of ataxia here will work on these with the, with the exception of this of AT, which I've put here. But um, XRCC1 definitely will work in the repair of these. Aprotaxin will, PMK will. TDP1 and 2 are both proteins that function in that undotting process. So they'll work here, but they definitely don't work down here. So definitely this route can lead to ataxia because if you don't have this or this, you will still get the progressive ataxia. Um, but this could contribute in certain situations, that ROS damage. Then that accumulation of these lesions leads to stalled transcription. 
And we say that because AOA2 doesn't function here at all, but can function here. So the question is, where does AT function? I've put it in bold here because I think um, there's, the evidence here is not that strong, but the reality is it could work either there or there. Um, but I think this might be the stronger candidate. Now, I put lots of calcium signaling here because a few talks ago, I talked about Tanya Paul's work who find, and she's used um, the brains from deceased ATM individuals and used age matched and gender matched controls. And she finds she gets a re what she sees is reduced proteins that function in this calcium signaling pathway. And what's really interesting about that is that there's some other spinocerebellar ataxias. So these tend to be dominant. Um, so so and by that means you only need one of your genes to be changed to get the disease. So they're slightly different. But some of these have mutations in the very same proteins that she seems to be, she sees missing in her brain, in, in her AT brains. So the idea is that all of this may be leading downstream to the loss of calcium signaling proteins, and that leads to ataxia. The other thing is these protein aggregates that we're seeing in some of the other disorders with associated um, neurodegeneration. And um, I put these in because Tanya Paul also sees increase in protein aggregates in her AT brains. So the idea and, and her model is that these accumulating lesions here can help form protein aggregates. Um, and she uh, explains that, and I'm not going through the science of it, but she, she pr provides a very nice explanation of why it might be happening. And that it's that that um, accumulates some of these calcium signaling proteins that may result in the loss of this calcium signaling. Um, and there's evidence that Alzheimer's can cause increased single strand breaks, ROS damage particularly, so that may be going through like that. Okay, so that's connecting some of these disorders in a kind of linear molecule. Now I'll just try and think how the different clinical trials I've talked about feed into all of this. So, but, so we've got the same sort of model here. So one of the first things I've talked about is the Eridol trial, dexamethasone, which is affecting inflammation. And really there's no direct evidence that, that there is inflammation and certainly what's causing it. But I think it's certainly possible that accumulating lesions, stored transcription or loss of calcium signaling could all cause inflammation. So I've kind of put the arrow in there, but we don't really know where that would be working. We talked about IB1001, and similarly, I don't think we really know where that would be working, and there's certainly no direct evidence that it will do anything, but there is some evidence that it could affect the mitochondria and help diminish the levels of ROS and keep the mitochondria normal, so stop this ROS increasing. I talked also about a drug called triheptanoin, which um, it will affect mitochondria. And the mitochondria dysfunction also is known to increase the levels of ROS. So that would feed in here. And um, what this triheptanoin does is try to stop this increased ROS. So that would fit down there. And then we've got NAD depletion, which is this um, NR drug that I've just talked about. And as I said, that's a very different model, but would say that some form of accumulated lesion is leading to the depletion of NAD. And it's that that leads to ataxia. Then from a research perspective, um, the, the work by Svetlana Koronin Kova, and I've spelt that wrongly, so I meant to change it, but forgot. Um, she thinks that the microglia, which are like immune cells almost in the brain, may be 
um, affecting dysfunctional neurons and adding to the progressive ataxia. So that would be feeding in here somewhere. And then I think what's very interesting is there's quite a lot of work going on on the calcium signaling change and how there might be some drugs that could be feeding in here to um, deal with loss of calcium signaling, but there's nothing known here. And of course, there's quite a lot going on here to try and work out what these different, um, what exactly is the lesion that is accumulating or is impaired in the other Atax in the other ataxias and the double strand, single strand brain repaired ataxias as well as AT and that feeding in there. So I'll stop there.